Dr. 9 TV.
There are over 100 million phones that can tell if you're using your knuckle or finger to touch the screen, as well as whether you're lifting the device to your ear. They are examples of projects that started here at the Future Interfaces Group Lab at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The lab has been around since 2014 and counts Google, Intel, and Qualcomm among its sponsors. Every year, they develop hundreds of speculative ideas, all to do with how we communicate with machines beyond the mode of keyboard, touchscreen, mouse, or even voice. We came here to see some of their latest ideas and what they might have to say about the future of human-computer interaction. I came to CMU as faculty about five years ago and founded the Future Interfaces Group. And we set up shop in this building a little bit off campus so we had lots of space to build crazy prototypes and put things together. I wanted to build on my PhD thesis research, which was looking at how to use the human body as a, like an interactive computing surface. And so we extended a lot of those themes and obviously I uh, took on uh, master's students and undergraduates and PhD and student researchers to extend that vision and help them sort of explore new frontiers in human computer interaction. A grand vision that the whole lab has, has brought into it is the notion of having intelligent environments. You know, right now, if you have a Google Home or an Alexa or one of these smart assistants sitting on your kitchen countertop, it's totally oblivious to what's going on around it. And that's true of your smartwatch and that's true of your smartphone. We want to make them truly assistive and they can fill in a lot of context like a good human assistant would be able to do. They need to have that awareness. Like when humans communicate, there's these verbal and nonverbal cues that we use, like you know, gaze and gesture and, and all these different things to enrich that conversation. In human computer interaction, you don't really have that. A lot of my current work is all about increasing implicit input bandwidth. So what I mean by that is increasing the ability for these devices to have contextual understanding about what's happening around them. So a good example of this is uh, sound. We have this project called Ube Acoustics that listens to the environment and tries to guess what's going on. If I teleported you into my kitchen, but I blindfolded you, and I started blending something or chopping vegetables, you'd be able to know that Chris is chopping vegetables or running the blender or turning on the stove or running the microwave. And so we just asked ourselves, well, if sound is, is so distinctive that humans can do it, can we not train computers to use the microphones that almost all of them have, you know, whether it's a smart speaker or even a smartwatch? You have all these sensors that other people have created that are at your disposal, and the question is, how do you put them together to do this in a low-cost and practical way? You have 12 messages and a meeting in 12 minutes. I think of smartwatches as like really capable computers. It's, they should be able to almost like transform the hand into like an ARM 2.0 as opposed to just extensions of the phone. Typically, accelerometers in the watch are around uh, 100 hertz. So here, what we did is we overclocked the accelerometer on the watch so that it becomes high speed. So you can see here, um, when I interact with this coffee grinder, you can actually see the micro vibrations that are propagating from my hand to the watch. You can't see that effect from the 100 hertz accelerometer because it's too close. Uh, the vibrations when I tap here and when I tap here are actually quite different. So I can basically transform this area around the watch into like an input platform. You could also combine this with the motion data. So when I like snap, I can basically either snap to turn on the lights, and then I can do this gesture and then twist to you know, adjust the lighting in that house. And then I could do like a clap gesture to turn on the TV and do like these types of gestures can navigate up and down. These are only a few of the hundreds of ideas that pop up at the lab every year. A couple of them turn into real startups. One of them is Kikso, which is behind the touchscreen technology we saw at the beginning. Another newer one is a computer vision startup called Sensors. One of the technologies that we did for smart environments was a camera-based approach. We noticed that in a lot of settings, like in you know, restaurants or libraries or airports or even out on the street, there's a lot of cameras these days. And, and what we asked, you know, could we turn these into a sensor feed? So you don't have to have someone in the back room looking at 50 screens, but can we somehow actionalize? And that's what we did in Zensors. Here's an example of how we can go make a question. So we have a camera. It's actually right above us. You can see us here right now. This updates you know, once every 30 seconds or once every minute. So the first thing you do is we select a region of interest, so in this case, these two sofas. It's going to be a, let's say, a how many, and now literally it's going to ask how many people are here. That's it. And right now it's saying there's three people here. And we're not just limited to these sofas. I could ask, is there a laptop or phones on this table? Is there food on this table? Anything you can ask, you can do it. So like I think the, the motto of the company kind of is, uh, if you can see it, we can sense it. 
So we're doing a real-time parking pilot right now with the city, and, and what we're using is existing cameras along the stretch to uh, basically count cars. So we can use that as a real-time model, potentially like real-time parking, but also just help people find parking spots. If you can direct them to adjacent parking, it can be much more efficient and reduce congestion and air pollution and so on. Deploying that sort of technology city scale requires a huge capital investment. At the end, as a number, it doesn't matter if it's produced by a video camera or by physical sensors in the pavement. So in order for technologies to be adopted downstream, past the research phase, into the engineering and commercialization phase, is they have to be practical. Feasibility is obviously critical. We like to tackle problems that we know we can make progress on, and what we balance that with is impact and value. The research is undoubtedly exciting, but what else happens when a security camera doesn't just see but understands? Any technology can be misused. What happens to an idea after it leaves the lab? It is a gray area. Sort of like cars. You're never going to make the 100% safe car. But that doesn't mean we should eliminate all cars. And we should think about that for technology, that no technology is ever going to be 100% secure or 100% privacy preserving. And so we always try to think about how to make these technologies that make the right trade-off. Because we have a vision of how they're going to exist. We can think about in our mind, oh, this would be so cool if I had this in my kitchen. But we're too close to that domain. We think everything is cool. All of the technologies that we build are put in front of users. And if you can get people to buy into the vision, then maybe they'll accept that, oh, but there's a microphone on this thing that could be listening to me in my kitchen. And if you make that value proposition right, they'll accept it. If you get that value proposition wrong, then it'll just falter. Dr. 9TV.